All right, chondrichthys, and then now we get into the elasmobranchs. Again, a really, really cool group. So let's get into our discussion here. All right, so we've established that we have, again, the chondrichthys. We have the primitive branch, the holocephali, the chimeras, uh, primitive type of fish. Then we get into this more evolved type of shark. Still considered primitive as far as fish go, but more evolved as far as chondrichthys go. So, a um, couple of what we call orders, different, uh, the lasmobranchi, this, this sort of branch of, of, of these evolved uh, sharks and, and, and stingrays and skates. Uh, we're going to break it up into two discussions, right? So, the sharks, the selachii and the rays and skates, the batoidae, right? So they're just weird names that they give these groups. But uh, we know that the chimeras, the holocephali, have four uh, gills. Three of them are covered. So again, we said that's kind of a primitive type of, of, of scenario. With the elasmobranchs, the, the selachii, the, the sharks, they're going to have between five to seven gill openings. Right, so one, two, three, four. So we can start to see more gill openings. More gill openings means the more gills uh, exchanging gases, uh, more oxygenation, which allows for greater activity, more respiratory capacity. So again, that is a good thing to have more gill openings there. So the sharks, I, I, I think most of you know what a shark is. Um, rays and skates, uh, these groups are going to be our uh, dorsoventrally flattened groups. So they're dorsal back, ventral belly, they're kind of squashed down. So you can see that, that, that flattened, uh, thin shape of the rays and skates. And again, that'll be for another discussion a little bit later. Let me focus now on the sharks. So sharks, um, big, big category, really cool category, right? I don't know if you watch Shark Week and, and Discovery Channel and Animal Planet or National Geographic. It's you know, a lot of neat things to, to learn about sharks. And science is discovering a lot of new things about sharks. So one of the first uh, sort of distinctions we're going to make is we're going to break sharks into two categories. The squalomorphiae and then the galeomorphiae. So these are two branches. So we look at our tree here. The extinct forms, these placoderms, kind of the precursor to modern sharks. And again, red indicating that they're extinct. So these went extinct, it was first distinction. Uh, and then we have some other, you know, these are extinct. Ostic, these are bony fish that we're gonna cover uh, you know, after we get through all the sharks. Um, there's our holocephali, our extinct Paleozoic sharks, and then we have these groups here, right? So there's our two branches of sharks, the squalomorphiae and then the galeomorphiae. So two branches, they're, they're closely related, but they are very, very distinct. When you think of a shark, you're going to, I, I am 100% I'm positive that you're going to think of a shark in this group. The Galeomorphia, a great white shark, hammerhead, whale shark, the mako sharks. These are what we consider to be sharks. Right? These are the ones that you see on Discovery Channel. This is what people are afraid of when they go to the ocean, that kind of stuff. People don't normally think about or consider these squalomorphia. These are smaller sharks. Think of about the size of a subway sandwich. You know, they're small, little skinny sharks that the, a lot of them are very, very deep ocean dwellers. Some of them are, are shallow water, but they're, they're smaller. Uh, dogfish sharks, sometimes they're called. So that's these squalomorphiae, weird characteristics. Um, this group tends to have the bioluminescent forms. So, so primitive, weird, uh, but they are sharks, right? But just something we don't consider very often. So I mentioned that the, the, the this uh, squalomorphiae sharks, they're, they're, they're pretty uh, 
um, pretty unique. And, and I think this is interesting. This is cool, I think, yeah. So these groups of sharks have these photophores, which are basically cells. They're, they're little cells that can do multiple things, right? One, the, depending on the species, they can actually generate their own light. And again, here we see these little cells that are generating light, typically blue light. Uh, a lot of the, the sharks that live in shallower water, uh, these squaliform sharks live in, in, in shallower water, these photophores can absorb one wavelength of light and then re-emit it in a different color. Right? So again, I don't know about you, but that's cool. You're swimming around at night and you see this sort of shark or in the day in certain light, it looks different, right? So they can modify the, the color that's coming off them due to these photophores, it's luminous cells, right? Why do they do this? Well, maybe it could be for communication between uh, shark to shark, maybe during a mating display, uh, maybe to attract uh, prey items, to different reasons that may differ from species to species. But again, two concepts here, bioluminescence to generate your own light and then biofluorescence to the light is not coming from them. It's coming from another source that they're just reflecting back in a different wavelength. So both of them are cool. Uh, and unique to these squalomorphi. We don't see that with these bigger sharks. All right, so when we get now into the, uh, the galeomorphi, these, these bigger groups, this is what you normally consider as a shark, right? And there's a lot of species, a lot of diversity, a lot of really cool biology uh, from the little cookie cutter sharks. Uh, everybody knows the great white shark. Um, short fin mako, uh, white tip reef shark, uh, blue shark, hammerhead shark, the big whale shark. So these are species I suspect you've heard of, right? When we look at these big galeomorphi sharks, um, not all of them, but the really well-known ones are top level predators of, of their environment. Right? So not all of these sharks are predators. The big whale shark is, is not a predatory shark. Um, it, it, it's a filter feeder, very, very passive type of shark. But when you think of predatory sharks, you normally think of, of members of this group. And, and there are some, some top level apex predators in the Galeomorphi group here. So a terrible place to be if you're a seal right there. Huh? Now, what enables these sharks to be such good at, at what they do, right? Well, one, they've been doing it a long time. They've been predators for a tremendously long time, and they've had a lot of time to refine, to, 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 to perfect some of these, these adaptations. Um, one of the first ones that they have is, is basically a, an ability to see in low light conditions. Depending on the shark species, uh, their eyes are, are better or, or a little bit worse than each other. Some of them have really good eyesight. Some of them are is okay eyesight. Uh, but all of them have this uh, kind of, if you can't see it too well here, but you have oops, this little basically enhancement of the eye. We're going to call that the tapetum lucidum. So it's basically almost like a mirror that helps to bounce back light within the eye and making them be able to see better in low light conditions. So the tapetum lucidum, good term for you to know there, right? Tapetum, tapetum lucidums are also seen in, 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 in vertebrates like dogs and cats and deer. If you shine a flashlight at your cat, you're gonna see that at night, these eyes fluoresce back. Uh, you shine a headlight at a deer when you're driving, you see those that eye shine reflect back. The same thing with sharks, right? They're, their eyes uh, reflect light with this tapetum lucidum. So it's a modification for nocturnal hunting. Uh, aside from the good uh, night sort of vision, um, or I'm not gonna say night vision, but they can see they're enhanced, their vision is enhanced in low light conditions, basically. Uh, they also have very powerful jaws, right? Flexible jaws, uh, again, with this sort of flexible uh, type of, of jaw structure. 
lots of teeth that we talk about in this tooth world, they constantly regenerate the teeth. So we see again a newer tooth there, an older tooth already moving out. And again, constantly throughout their whole life, uh, replacing damaged teeth, moving teeth out. So they'll have multiple teeth uh, available for, uh, for predatory use at, you know, at, any, at any moment in time. Uh, a lot of sharks, a lot of these predatory sharks, especially the mako shark, the speed racer of the group, um, these are going to have their anatomy, the, 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 the strong tail, the you know, very powerful lateral muscles uh, that enable them to generate a lot of force, acceleration, and, and speed in the water. So up to about eh, maybe a little less than 45 miles an hour um, in water, that's fast. Right? So they, I don't know what human swim, Michael Phelps, maybe... I don't, I don't even think maybe 20 miles an hour. Uh, and, and, and these fish go up to about 45 miles an hour. So that's, that's a lot of speed in, in, in the water. Um, when we look at these two top modifications. We got to spend some time here. These are cool and these are amazing. These are what enable sharks to do what they do so efficiently. Right? We, we heard about the lateral line. Lateral basically is on the side, so on the side of their body. It's a row of exposed nerves that picks up uh, things like blood in the water, it picks up uh, movement, it picks up different chemicals, different smells. So if you've ever seen sharks, they kind of circle and circle. They put their lateral line perpendicular to their prey item, trying to pick up as much of that sort of olfactory kind of smell, um, you know, ability within the water there right and if you see their their snouts a lot of little like little pits all these little pits are what we call the ampullae of lorenzini and, and these are these are amazing right so our, our ampullae so the ampullae are these little sensory pits and i'll i'll, I'll put a little video to kind of elaborate these as well these little sensory pits there. Oops. So we have all of these exposed. These are the little ampullae, like little little old old fashioned little vases. Um, these are the ampullae that will pick up these signals here. And they're going to have them all scattered throughout their snout, all scattered throughout their snout, their head, their eyes. And basically, if you know something about an ECG. Right, you've been at the doctor's office. Maybe you had these electrodes sort of matched up on you. Uh, the ECG electrodes give us information about our electromagnetic signals, right? Um, all the electrical activity going on in the heart, electrical activity going on in the muscles. So uh, somebody very intelligent made this into a machine. They copied but was already present in the shark's physiology. So the sharks have this, they've evolved this over a long time. They basically have a portable uh, ECG recording machine. And it's more sensitive than any machine that we have available in our modern uh, hospital facilities, right? These ECGs are, are powerful. And, and uh, again, they enable the shark to know you're there a long time before you know that the shark is there, right? If you imagine you're swimming, there's muscle contraction, your heart is beating. Um, so the, 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 the shark is picking up all that, right? Uh, even if you're not swimming, you're just there and you know there's a shark around, I promise you, your heart's gonna be beating very, very fast. So as your heart is beating fast, it's sending this information in the water being picked up by the ampullae. So these ampullae make the sharks, again, an extremely efficient predator at, at finding and locating prey and sensing which prey is swimming more healthily, faster, slower. So again, a really, really effective um, sort of uh, anatomical modification that they've evolved. So the ampullae of Lorenzini on the snout, electromagnetic information, and the lateral line, basically the sense of smell along the side of their body there. So uh, the best example that you know of, of these predatory sharks is the great white shark, right? Carcharodon carcarius. But if you notice, it's not actually all white, right? The belly is white, 
a lot of these predatory sharks have that counter shading. Uh, they're going to be white on the bottom, and the top of their body is this dark gray. Let me back up here. So you saw predatory shark, white on the bottom, gray on top. White on the bottom, gray on top. White on the bottom, kind of blue on top. White on the bottom, dark on top. So uh, again, what benefit would this have for these predatory sharks? And even non-predatory sharks, right? We have white on the belly and then sort of dark and spotted up top, the whale shark. But again, the hypothesis is that if you're a potential prey item um, above the shark you know, on the surface, right? And you look into the water, you see the dark ocean floor. So a dark top will, will camouflage you against that sort of dark ocean bottom, right? If you're below the shark and looking up, you're going to see the sort of the sky. You're going to see the, the light is going to be brighter. So a bright belly is going to kind of help match and camouflage it a little bit there. We call that counter shading. It's a strategy used a lot by, by these sharks as well. So something so simple as just this sort of tone of color on top or bottom uh, makes a big difference in the effectiveness of these predators as well. And we talk about the power, right? This is power, being able to propel the heavy mass of the cartilage endoskeleton moving through the water, uh, applying trigonometry and, and, and physics, uh, sort of estimating that angle correctly and then lunging up and getting the prey at him. That, that's impressive. So many of these sharks don't chase down the predators, or I should say, they don't chase down the prey. So the predators, um, maybe the mako will do this, but, but most of the other sharks don't attack from behind, they attack sort of that angle from below. So uh, there is some mental processing going there as well, right? So just an impressive predator, impressive amounts of power, uh, just again, sharks, right? It's really, really cool organisms. Hammerheads, I always thought these were strange, right? I thought, man, I don't understand this shark. Uh, it's swimming forward, but his eyes are looking sideways. Right? And this gives us an insight too. If the eyes are, are not facing where the shark is going, how critical then are the eyes? So we have all of the ampullae of Lorenzini. We have the lateral line. So I would hypothesize that but yeah, they get visual information. They can move the head side to side, but they're really relying more on the ampullae and that ampullae is giving them a realistic a picture of what's going on in the world around them. So the eyes are like a secondary type of, of sensory input for them, but, but very large uh, effective predators as well. Um, regional header, uh, well, I was gonna, Break this into a second. And yeah, let me finish this here. I'll, I'll include it here. So I don't want this to get too big, too long, but let me address the idea of heterothermy. This is actually relatively new, right? This was relatively new to science. I would say within the last five years or so, we're, we're discovering, science is discovering this idea of heterothermy. It's always been assumed that sharks were cold-blooded. You may have heard that term, cold-blooded or poikilothermic. Um, we know some reptiles. Most reptiles are poikilothermic. Uh, the agnathans, uh, poikilothermic, they're, they're cold-blooded. So what that means, if it's 50 degrees in the water, that animal is 50 degrees. Right? If it's 80 degrees in the water, that animal is 80 degrees. So they're environmental conformists. They conform their body temperature to the body temperature around, right? Um, ectothermy, that they get it from, they get the heat from the world around them. And that's what uh, these uh, fish biologists used to consider sharks to be until uh, new technologies, new ways of, of analyzing. Um, uh, we've learned a lot of new things, a lot of neat things on sharks, right? They're given a title now called regional heterothermy. Hetero means different. Thermy means temperature. So what 
has been found in these sharks, and we call the lamnidae sharks, the the mackerel sharks, the, the great white shark, the mako shark, right? Um, these very fast swimming sharks with the, what we call worldwide distribution. They, they're found in all different oceans in the world. And they, people were wondering, well, well, how is that possible? How can a shark that's typically found in the tropics now move up into cold water? Or how can a shark that lives in the Pacific Ocean with that cold water, how can they be active and functional the way they are? So a lot of research was done and it has been found now that these sharks, these heterothermic sharks, can vary the body temperature in different parts of their body. That's a, that's a big deal, right? That's a big deal. That's like, wow. We thought they were super primitive fish. They're much more complex than what we originally thought. So um, they are capable of basically warming up their blood as, as they're swimming. Their muscles generate heat, and that heat is not dissipated out into the ocean. That heat is then collected in certain blood vessels. These reeds, we call them like little networks of, of blood vessels. Um, that, that those moving um, muscles then help to heat themselves and keep themselves warm. And they also help to keep the eyes and particularly the brain area warm as well. So the warmer the brain is, the warmer the eyes are, the more uh, sensory information this fish can get. The warmer the muscles stay, um, the more easy it will be for this fish to be a functional predator, right? So wow, breaking uh, old ideas of what we thought sharks could do. And, and sharks, again, more primitive than some of these other fish, but more primitive, but having more sophisticated uh, strategies and physiological mechanisms to, to stay warm than more advanced fish. So uh, what the actual mechanism, the, the, the way it works, uh, we have these countercurrent heat exchange. So it's a, a switching off of heat. So we heat this point, that heat is then dissipated through warm blood to different parts of the body. So countercurrent heat exchange in an extensive system of ritia. So ritia are these basically nets, like little networks of, see, like a little net, little net, little net, little net of blood vessels here. So once that blood is warmed, it's sent to areas that are a little cooler to warm that area. And, and uh, blood can be shunted and shifted from place to place. So we see here the body cavity, uh, some of the active muscles in the core are much warmer than some of this external area. So again, that is uh, a mechanism that makes them function in colder waters. So, um, so can great white sharks exist in the cold Pacific waters? Yes, they can because of this system. Can great white sharks be up in, I don't know, off the coast of uh, Maine, Rhode Island out in the you know, northeastern US? Yes, they can because of this system as well. So pretty neat uh, discovery that they found. So with that, let me stop this one here. Uh, take a little break. Uh, I'm gonna try to associate some other YouTube videos with this as well. And again, soak all this in and I'll try to get through this. I don't know if I'll finish it today, but uh, for sure by tomorrow, I'll have completed all of the discussion on these, uh, the, the Chondrichthys lecture here. Right? So I'll see you a bit later and soak all this in. And until next time. Yeah.